Kia ora everyone, and welcome to the summer season of Pod Uni. My name is Tama, and I'm the student producer of the summer season. In this episode, Colin interviews renowned Kiwi author and playwright Fiti Heriaka. Their discussion ranges from how to write for effective vocal delivery to the anatomy of a story, all important points for an aspiring podcaster to consider. Fiti recently received the Acorn Award, one of the most prestigious fiction prizes in Aotearoa, for her novel Kurangaituku. It tells the Māori legend of Hatupatu and the Bird Woman from the perspective of Kurangaituku, the Bird Woman. The craziest thing about it is, you can start the book from either end. Once you reach the middle, you flip it over and read from the other end. It's unlike anything I've ever read before, and I can't recommend checking it out enough. Over to Fiti and Colin. Tēnā koutou, uh, ko uh, Tongarero Tōku Maunga, um, ko mm, Tōpone Tia Te Moana, ko Ngāti Tūwhare Toa, me Te Arua, me Tuharangi, me mm, Ngāti Whakaue, me Ngāti Tūma Tāwera, me Tainui, me Pākea Ahau, uh, ko Whiti Heriaka Tōku Ingoa. Um, kia ora, I'm Whiti Heriaka, I am a writer, um, and I'm Happy to be here. Tēnā koe, Fiti. Yeah. Thank you for being here. <laughs> so, um, your latest novel. Yes. Karangai tuku. Karangai tuku. Yes. Yes. Well, I like how you said that. Oh, I don't know if I say it as well as you do. <laughs> Karangai tuku. It's, yeah, it's just, it is fun to say. <laughs> it is fun it's to say. It's really delightful to yeah. say. Um, it has a lot to say, that novel, about the work and that stories do, the sort of power that stories can um, have uh, in the world. Yeah. And so I'd be curious to know if you could tell us a little bit about how you understand the power of stories and what stories can do, the work. Isn't, yeah. Yeah, that's a big question and a good question. Um, yeah, so I guess part of the novel, Kurangai Tuku, is telling the story of herself to invent herself. So um, I think storytelling is an important part of how we yeah, tell our own identities to the world. Um, so in Kurangaituku and in the novel beforehand uh, that I wrote called Legacy, both of them are really concerned with story sovereignty, mm. about who gets to tell their own stories and the way they tell their own stories. So I think it's really important um, that we have our stories and that we get to tell them in the way that we want to tell them. Also, I guess, in, the, in terms of importance of stories and, and how they are, Kurangaituku is an attempt to sort of de- decolonize uh, Māori stories. Mm. Um, it's based on a pūrāko that I grew up with, um, Hatupatu and the Bird Woman, but from her point of view. But the story I grew up with was written by a Pākehā man. So it was um, one one of the read um, copies of Hatupatu and the Bird Woman. So I read it from that lens rather than from a Māori lens. Um, so again, it's that story sovereignty kind of idea. So I wanted to retell the story in a way that was closer to oral storytelling mm. in the novel. Um, so if you look at the novel you can approach the novel from either side and you can start from either side. So you read towards the middle, which is the end, which is not the end. Um, so it's got this, this this weird structure. If um, you could see me in the studio, I'm moving my hands in circles, um, but you can't. But just believe me, that's what I'm doing. So uh, part of the reason I wanted to do that structure is to emulate um, oral storytelling. So say you went to somewhere to hear a story back in the day back before you know um, settlers had come to New Zealand chances are the storyteller wouldn't just start at the beginning of a cycle so the Maui stories they might not, not start with Maui being born they would instead look at the audience look at what's the context of the day and decide to tell a story based on what was happening um, at that time. Mm. So a story that would help people perhaps at that time to find a lesson that they might need to learn um, or something that something that happened during the day that might have inspired 
part of the story. So, yeah, they're a bit, a bit more fluid in, in the way that you tell a story, not strictly linear. So I wanted to do that in this novel as well. So looking at how we might tell stories in a way that's from more of a te ao Māori lens than our classical, classical, she says with... You can't see it as well. (laughs) (laughs) Doing inverted commas or bunny ears. Um, A classical way of of telling um, a story in Western, in the Western canon. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. That's powerful. Tell me about um, story sovereignty and how that um, aligns with or contrasts with what, what you're describing there as kind of a a Western mode of storytelling, which has certain ideas about linearity, but also certain ideas about authorship and ownership and, mm-hmm. and one version of a story or what do we do with multiple versions? So how does how does that sovereignty yeah, differ from or a lot or not with? The... Yeah, I guess I've been pushing back a bit um, when people have been interviewing me and saying, oh, this, so is this the story? Is this Kurangai Tuku, like in, in big, bold um, capital letters and no no it's just a version of it um, even the way I've spelt her name is different so there are people that, is, that um, have kuru ngaituku mm. rather than kura ngaituku so yeah there are different different versions of her story um, I'm not the definitive <laughs> storyteller of this story nor that I, I wouldn't want to be it's I think my part, my job as a writer is to invite conversation. And I talk about that quite a lot in the book. Mm-hmm. Well, couldn't I talk to talk about that? Ooh, <laughs> sliding in between me and her <laughs> again. Um, that a story doesn't exist just with the storyteller. That it is in a space between you and the audience. So you need an audience. Um, you need that space between us. There's an understanding between us. Um Yeah, I like that kind of idea that a story, when it's being told, is being reinterpreted by the listener or the reader, and it becomes their story too. Yes. So they bring everything that they know to the reading of the story. So, of course, it's going to be a different story from what someone else read. That's why I think we have these great discussions about whether good books are good or bad. It's because we've bought a whole bunch of our expectations, our education, our knowledge of of that story to the story. Mm. So I think that's a really exciting part about being a storyteller. Yeah. Is that you don't know what someone else will bring. Hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And you have this beautiful kind of metaphor in the book about um, threads that each telling of a story is a kind of thread and woven together. They can be a rope and that yeah. rope can be a, a like a a, a a noose around uh, a monster's neck monster in air quote bunny yeah. bunny ears <laughs> <laughs> or it can that rope can do other things right yeah. And, um yeah can you explain how that how that metaphor works and how you think about um that as as a storyteller a part of a conversation you said yes i like i like the idea of of many tellings of a story or contributing to like a big telling of it so we learn different things from different ways that people have told the story um, so some people focus on Kurangaituku being a monster perhaps and so you learn um, to be careful in, in the bush hopefully you learn that and to be respectful of um, the bush and the peop- and the creatures and the non-creatures and the non-people within it so those, those are some lessons that you learn from there and someone else tells the, the story about Hatupatu's bravery so all of these are facets of the story, and I think you get a, a richer view from reading all of them. That kind of thread to rope metaphor, I'm always thinking of um, Maui um, slowing the sun or pulling up the North Island. He didn't do it alone. So mm. yes, he was the, the leader, I guess, but he was with his brothers. So it's the kind of many hands make light work kind of idea I guess Mm. that with yeah there's so much more more richness if you include other people's minds other people's ideas other people's lenses on a topic a story so I don't know why you wouldn't I guess maybe I'm greedy no maybe no 
Yes. Seems beautiful no. to, to, to <laughs> join and link those stories together. And yeah. And I guess it's sort of like fuck a papa in a way too. Like I am, we all are, the um, from our ancestors, like generations and generations of people have come together to create what we are today. Same with stories. Generations mm. of people have, have told those stories and each generation has added a bit or taken away a bit. Um, and it's not to say that each any generation's story is the kind of definitive story. I don't think that that would be right. Stories need to evolve with us to be useful. Um, those lessons, hopefully, continue to be useful. So it might be that we put them in a different setting to make them more modern, but the like core lesson of, of the story is the same from way back when. Mm. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's beautiful. I like it. Thank <laughs> you. That's, yeah, that's, yeah, it's just, it's, um, it's refreshing to not have debates about definitive versions and, and the only ones and this kind of singularity of authorship and ownership over ideas and narratives is, yeah. is kind of sticky slash icky. Yeah, and that, I don't know, I think that feels like you're excluding people rather than bringing them into the, the fold, into the story. Yeah, I just want to hear what other people think. Hmm. Yeah, hmm. interested in other people's stories. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, how did you choose to make this story a novel with its very fun structure of, of <laughs> non-linearity instead of um, a play, which you've written plenty of before? Yeah. Or it is kind of epic poetry in a way, too. So, or, or Or an oral narrative, a performance piece of some sort? Yeah, I don't know. Um, it could have been a play. I think it would have been a very long play. <laughs> Very boring play. Um, oh, it could be fun though to to, to like fun, start from one side and different sides and be. like. Uh, oh yeah. Mm. Mm. For future scholars, they can look up what I was re referencing then. Um, oh, you can just say it if you want. I could. Yes. <laughs> was it the play we were talking about earlier? It was a play we were talking about earlier. So, oh, when was that? Two thousand and six, maybe. Yes, two thousand and six. Uh, my sister and I put on a play for Stab in Wellington. And that was an experimental theatre uh, festival. Yeah, festival that's was yearly. I can't remember if, it, if it's still going because COVID and all mm -hmm. that, that stuff. Um, but we had a big theatre space, a space for a theatre, and we had two plays that were running simultaneously. And some of the actors went through the doors to the other plays at the same time. And then halfway through, the audience swapped so they went on the other side of the wall to see the other play so you could hear the play on the other side of the wall you couldn't see what was happening you could hear bits of it um and hopefully by the end of it you had a a fuller understanding of what was happening in that space at that time so yeah i'm kind of playing with that too in Kurangai Toku. so i could have done that yes as a play i don't know why i chose to do it as a novel uh i think when I first conceived of it, it was probably like the second novel I was going to write. But because it took so long, it ended up being the fourth novel <laughs> <laughs> that I've written. Worth the, so, worth the wait <laughs> or the I, work. I needed that time, yeah. Mm. So um, I tell that story quite a lot of, which I think is, is good for other writers to hear and particularly for, for young writers, because sometimes you see books in the bookstore and think, oh, wow, that person just worked all the way through and they didn't have any doubts and it's on the on the shelf. That must be amazing to feel that way. No, no, full of doubts. Um, so kind of halfway through, or maybe the second draft of Kurangai Toku, I th thought that I didn't have the skills to write the novel that I wanted to write, I just didn't. I wasn't which which enough. part of were you worried about? What, the 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 all of it, all of it, all of it. The all structure, it. the sentence level, the rhythms of the yeah. language. 
Wow. So when I first conceived of it, <laughs> I, I'm laughing now because you know, past me was so ambitious and I love her for that. But anyway, <laughs> so I wanted to write a novel that started at the beginning of time, which it does now. It starts in Te Kore. Um, but yeah, the original plan was to stretch to the end of time. I love this plan. Yeah. Please write that. <laughs> it's bloody hard to write that. <laughs> I was like, how, Especially when your publisher is that? saying, please do it in 250 pages or less. Yeah, <laughs> please, please, just sometime this century, finish your, your novel. Um, so yeah, that was my original plan. It was too big. Um, and I hadn't quite got her voice. I hadn't quite got Kurung Naitoku's voice. Um, I guess my, my dirty secret is that when I was a playwright and partly in, in novels too, I really don't like writing monologues. And I don't like writing in first person. I find it, I find it really hard to. Which this novel is a lot of. Yeah, this novel is like first person. Yeah. It is pretty much a whole three hundred and something page monologue. So obviously I've gotten over that a little bit. Mm-hmm. But yeah, when I was thinking I don't have the skills to do this, that's one of the the things I was pushing against. It's like I don't like writing in this in this point of view. I don't know how to get there. Ah. Mm. ideas so I wasn't going to give up on the novel I still wanted to write that story I just needed to yeah hone my skills a bit so I went and wrote legacy sort of in between Mm. so yeah now looking back on it looking at legacy and Kurangai Tuku I can see that I'm working out some of the um ideas around yeah story sovereignty mm. um about whose story who gets to tell a story in legacy and i'm also working out some of the how to i guess wrangle time so legacy is written there are three time periods in legacy so it's a story about a contemporary teenager or contemporary like 2015 because that's when it was set um who goes back in time and lives as his great 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 grandfather I should know that I wrote it <laughs> <laughs> Some, one of those greats um, in World War One. so it slips between time and there's also um, through it an an oral historian talking to his grand the grandfather so that's in the 70s mm. um, so yeah there's the 2015 strand the 70s strand and um, the 1915 strand. So just getting my head around how to how to use the the tools I have in writing a novel to like bridge those gaps in time mm. and how to tell a story through that. So yeah, I had to learn some more of my craft before I could finish um, Kurangai Toku. Yeah. And do you think the temporality element is maybe one thing that the novel is well suited for that maybe other forms of storytelling aren't? Or like, because it's so, its structure is so fascinating and delightful. And, or, yeah, I'm just. I think so. I think, I think you can do that in other forms as well. I think, yeah. I mean, obviously, film, um, radio drama, you can do it quite. Yeah. And you can do some nice things with that. Um, I guess the nice thing about writing a novel is that it's sort of self-contained as well. I just have me <laughs> mm. to contend with, mm. rather than thinking like the practicalities when I'm writing a script for film or for TV, um, particularly for TV, uh, or theatre, is I have to think of, okay, how much budget do we have? Right. How many people can I hire? Mm, not that many people. Can I double up these these parts? All that make it muddy, like for the audience. So there's all these sort of practical things that you're thinking of when you're writing, with other people in mind, that you don't really have to think about when you're writing a novel. Mm-hmm. I mean, you do have to work with publisher and editor, but that's kind of further down the track, rather than up front when I'm writing a script. Yeah, I've got all these other things in mind, like how many people. How many people can I can I shove on the stage and still pay them well? Right. Um, what space am I going to be putting it in? So what kind of crazy things can I do in that space? Uh, I might have to pull that back. Mm. But I can go for gold, yeah, 
go for it in a novel. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. It's free. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's something freeing about having the story about a character whose story sovereignty is at the core of the narrative yeah. to be free just in this space to just have that character talk directly to you, the reader. Yeah. And it's it's feels so deeply intimate that and that's the nice thing about first person and I was bagging first person before um, but that's the nice thing about first person is that you can be in that in that person's brain hmm. which you can do on stage and on, on film with voiceovers and oh, but yeah you, we're both rolling our eyes at voice voiceovers <laughs> <laughs> yes yes we are <laughs> because yeah it's it can be so clumsy yeah 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 that's right so tell me about, um, you've used the word storyteller quite a bit, and we're talking about also novelist you and playwright you, yes. and you wear lots of hats. I do. do you identify with one of those creative hats more than another? Like, are you, would you say you're a storyteller or not? swap them author? over a bit, quite a bit now. Um, lately, I've been leaning towards storyteller because I think it opens it up a little bit more. Um, because I think it's the mode of, of telling story, whatever mode you're telling it in. So whether that be oral or writing a novel or writing a film, those are all valid ways of, of telling a story. So I think writer for me just feels like you're writing it down, like it's on paper. So that excludes a whole lot of amazing people who are telling stories. That will probably change. Because, uh, like my hair color, <laughs> which changes seem it seems to change. Like which is a fantastic pink time. right now. It's a very hot pink at the moment, yes. but it was platinum blonde not long ago. Mm. Um, yeah, it will probably change on a whim. So in the past, I've been introducing myself as a playwright novelist, but because I haven't written a play, like a full length play, in maybe ten years, I've kind of swapped that over to novelist playwright at the moment. But yeah, who knows? It mm. might be a thing. It might change again. Well, and the story of ourselves doesn't have to be fixed That's either. True. Just like the stories that we tell yeah. can be fluid. With I quite like kaitohi as well. So I don't know. Mm. <laughs> mm. But storyteller seems to encompass a lot of what I do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, in the novel, it's clear that stories can create. Mm. They can kind of also mute voices yeah. they stories can do lots of things um they seem very very powerful in in, in your hands <laughs> in the narrative are there things that this is maybe a totally bizarre question it may not go anywhere are there things that stories can't do wash the dishes yes oh. <laughs> god <laughs> dog it i wish they only. could yeah. do the washing <laughs> although that's not true because if you told a story about a robot, then that might inspire people to make that robot. Hmm. So, I don't know. Maybe stories are can can wash the dishes. Hmm. They just haven't. We just haven't got there yet. Yes, we haven't made it there in the story. Yeah, I mean we've got dishwashers. What am I talking about? Yeah. But they don't load themselves. I know. Self-loading dishwashers. What I'm talking about. That's what we need. More <laughs> stories about that, so we can create that. Please. Yeah. So it manifests <laughs> in the world. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. What can't stories do? Um, I don't know. That's hard for a writer because our lives are stories. So we mm. just think stories can do everything, I think. Yeah. I. That's sort of why I asked because I teach podcasting through the lens of rhetoric and rhetoric is very much a discipline that's very focused on its re speaker's relationship to their audience. Mm. That the kinds of the way you tell a story, the way that you give a speech is always dictated by the context around you. Just like you said earlier, and, and yeah. who you're talking to and when you're talking to them. Yes. And what medium you're using and how long do you have and all and you draw on all of those resources to make your speech or to write your piece that you're writing. But rhetoric people have a way of sort of seeing everything as rhetoric yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's just sort of just sort of like i can imagine storytellers see everything as a story and, and i'm always interested in like where are the limits of this uh, are there limits yeah are there should they, they be limits? i don't know yeah well, yeah maybe if there aren't limits yeah maybe we're limiting ourselves by thinking that there's limits i mean i think we are stories we tell ourselves our own story all the time like 
yeah, I'm getting up to do this, I've done this. People write in their diaries, that's the story of themselves. The way you dress is a story, mm. like how you present yourself to, mm-hmm. to the world. So yeah, I think... Mm. Everything is a story if you if you try hard enough. And, and <laughs> yes, yes, and I love also the way that you invite the reader into Kurangaituku's mm. story, right? That, that as that we're part of the creation of that story. That we're yeah. and same with each other's stories as we go through our lives. We're also contributing to other people's stories as well as crafting our own. Yeah, it's that thread thing again. We're all threads yes. in other people's stories. Yeah. We're just the lead thread in our story. That's it. Yeah. For now. <laughs> yeah, for now. Until someone else takes <laughs> over the thread. <laughs> um, super duper. Uh, can I ask you some questions about writing and speaking? Because, okay. Because um, if you haven't heard, listeners, um, Fiti Reed, she is a spectacular reader. Uh, the rhythms of your language um, and the way that you... Um, yeah, crunch those consonants and open those vowels and linger in the pauses is just, it's mesmerizing. Um, so tell me, but it's also really hard to like write yeah. words to be spoken. And it's clear to me, I don't know if this was your goal, but it was clear to me that this is a story or this novel is one that wants to be heard as well as read. Yeah. How do you do that? How do you write to, for a speech? How do you do that? It's hard. It is hard. It is hard. So, I, yeah, I very much set out to write something that sounded like you were being read to. Hmm. So I, I set out to write something orally. Not orally, orally. Sorry. Yes, that's an important difference. <laughs> New Zealand consonants, um, not consonants, vowels, though, we kind of get them mushed up together. Anyway, yeah, orally. So thinking about rhythm in particular. So... A lot of my writing or rewriting of this, I, w- I read the whole thing aloud. Amazing. I yeah. love that. I love yeah. that. Yeah. So I, would, I read it. I always say this to my students as well when they're uh, looking at their work, to read it aloud because you can instantly hear when something's not working. You, you hear it so much faster than when you're looking at it on the page. When you look at, look at it on the page, you can kind of go, oh, yeah, that's fine. It'll do. It looks fine. But yeah, as soon as you read it out loud, you can you will trip over where it's not working. Yes. Um, you will hear it when you're getting bored with a passage. So you need to like strike that out. Because if you can't read it out loud, then your reader has got less patience than you do for, mm. for your work. So yeah. So part of it is, is just the, the work of reading it out loud and, and writing it to be read out aloud. For, I guess, this is the kind of hard thing to to teach when I teach writing for the stage, is to, dialogue is tricky, because to make it sound natural, you have to write it in a really unnatural way. Hmm. Tell me more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so normal speech, we have ticks and we have fillers. So where there's um, uh, oh, things, we also don't always get to the point. Mm. Yes. <laughs> yes, very much so now. <laughs> so we talk around things a lot because a lot of times when we're talking normally to each other, to, we haven't figured out what we're going to say. So it takes us a while to get around to the point. So often people will like go around the point and around and around and around. If you transcribe that exactly for the stage, it's so boring. Yes. It's so boring. Yes. So we now as a little baby writer, little baby writer, um, I had an internship at RNZ in the drama department when they had a, a very big drama department. Uh, and my idea was to go out with some microphones and just capture people's conversations in cafes and things and then transcribe it and make this sort of soundscape of just natural speech. Like, like found poetry. Like but found but, poetry, but, yeah. but Oh, I love this. But found dialogue. Yeah, found dialogue. But it didn't work because people don't talk in the way that's interesting and engaging, in the way that you expect in a play or a drama. So people don't, don't talk in the way that makes it interesting. Hmm. Unless you're in the conversation, hmm. mostly. Some people are amazing conversationalists, but for the most, for the most part, people are yeah. yeah, just trying to find their way to the words. So yeah, when you're writing dialogue, you want it to sound natural. Yes. So that's the, that's the goal. But to sound natural, you do a whole bunch of unnatural things to make it sound natural. So 
in writing dialogue, usually the dialogue has a point. So people have an agenda, which when we're talking normally, you might not have an agenda. I mean, some some people do, of course, mm. but you might not in, in just normal speech. So when you're saying, have you got, have you got, pass me the butter, or have you got the toast? <laughs> <laughs> in normal life. No it's, agenda. It's no agenda. <laughs> you're just looking for the butter. But in a play. On stage. That might have like. A, oh, yeah. the butter. Have you got the butter? <sighs> <laughs> so yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff underneath <laughs> it that you don't, um, that you don't have in, in normal life. So taking out all the ums and ahs, making sure that people have an agenda, um, and that they're playing off it against each other. So sometimes in, in conversations, the other person is not talking at all, and that's fine in a normal conversation, but on stage that needs to be a deliberate act. So silence speaks a whole lot of stuff. So yeah, all of these things that if you look at it on a page, it's like, oh, that doesn't that doesn't look like normal speech but yeah when you hear it mm. it does mm-hmm. but it's not it's very different yeah very so tricky. it is very tricky mm. but I think you can develop an ear for it so what I used to do um, and sometimes still do I'll admit it <laughs> <laughs> is go on public transport okay. and put on headphones yes but not play anything mm. and just listen to people around so I put on headphones so don't seem like a creep yes when I'm like because I can put on headphones and look like I'm listening to something intently when you're actually listening, when I'm listening to, to them people. intently <laughs> yeah so That's, I can kind of lean to people but I'm oh she's just listening to a podcast so she's not listening to me talking about you know my affair with so and so or whatever it is so I listen to, to, to people on public transport and then I, I'm listening to their rhythm more than I am what they're talking about because oh. everyone has like a a fingerprint almost of the way they speak. Hmm. So I try and, and put that into my characters as well. Whoa. So some people speak quite quickly. Yes. Um, some people can speak very slowly and they use long big words and long pauses. Hmm. Or like you were saying before, they eat up the, the vowels for too long when they're, when they're speaking. Oh, I thought um, your vowels were magnificent. <laughs> that, is, that is praise. <laughs> that is praise. That is praise. Um, so yeah, and try and replicate that when I'm I'm writing. So for me, my goal when I'm writing dialogue for the stage or on in a novel is that if you covered over the characters' names or the speech tags in the mm. novel, you'd be able to tell you who's speaking. Know. You should know. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So that's a rhythmic thing. Like I don't get it right all the time, of course. Yeah. Because it's a journey, but that's my aim. Yeah. So, how yeah. did you find the rhythm of Kurangaituku's voice? Yeah, it took a long time. Mm. It took a long time. So, I think that was part of the st- the struggle, the struggle of writing mm. was finding her voice because it's not quite human because she's not quite human, and it's not quite Maori because she's not Maori. Like yeah. her story is part of Te Ao Maori, but her she herself isn't quite right right. so yeah trying to find um trying to find it was was hard in that way and also trying to imagine what it's like to be her was really difficult so in the first like in te kore she's not anything she is a spirit she doesn't have a body yes she doesn't exist so in the story she comes into being from the imaginations of other creatures. So first the birds and then humans. humans. So even like trying to think how how does one tell a story if you don't exist? Well, you do exist, but you don't exist corporeally. Right. So even thinking about like she wouldn't have vocal cords. Yes, yes. So how would she make sound and she doesn't and oh is that a spoiler no it doesn't she does she doesn't have a voice she doesn't know yeah and oh i almost said it <laughs> yes <laughs> i'm allowed to spoil it um she doesn't have a voice in in the novel like a physical voice in the novel obviously she has a voice um in the novel itself because metaphor the, the, her, her words but yes. yeah she doesn't have a physical voice that would have made writing it as a play difficult 
just <laughs> try to tell this without a voice. <laughs> yeah. Go. Go. <laughs> it's a really complex inner life you have. Yeah. Um, when you <laughs> but you can't speak it at all. That's right. And I hate voiceovers. So and I'm also not it do starts that. in Tecora. Go. <laughs> yeah. Go. To the end of time. <laughs> you are also in this giant, like, bird, half bird, half woman creature who's always sore because her body's in flux. So, yeah, mm. that would have been difficult. Mm. Not impossible, but difficult. I see now how the novel gives you space to explore these things in other ways that... To build that fare that you talk about, that storytelling fare. Because yeah. and, and her not having a voice is really important to the story. Yes. Because a big part of the story is her finding her voice through writing the novel or having the novel being written or her story being told. So, yeah, maybe it is only possible in a, in a novel. Hmm. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting hearing you talk about trying to figure out the way that she communicates because she's not human, she's not Maori, she's, you know, she's, how does she speak? And it, there is something, I don't know if ethereal is the right word, <laughs> but yeah. like the like the rhythms of the language, especially in those opening sections of both sides, whichever side you start on, um, <laughs> are just yeah they are otherworldly in a way they're well it was really interesting so uh, I'm lucky that Huya my publishers have got a really strong um, te reo Māori editing team because I needed it because I don't speak te reo Māori fluently I'm a very enthusiastic learner and user perhaps so Mm -hmm. I was sprinkling te reo Māori words and concepts throughout this novel with abandon and oftentimes they'd come back and go mm, I don't think that's the word you mean to use in that context for tea. You know? mm. so so mm. learning that was great but someone on the team and I can't remember who Aroha Mai because it was a long time ago um, but pointed out that we should lose all the possessive S's on Māori names in particular. Mm, mm-hmm, so mm-hmm, instead mm-hmm. of saying Hatupatu's eyes, we say the eyes of Hatupatu. Yes. So to do that, I had to rewrite things in a passive voice. Yes. What we would call a passive voice in, in the Western canon. Yes. But it's closer to how te reo Māori is constructed. Yes. So in a weird way, the rhythms of Krangaituku are te reo Māori but in English. Yeah. Yeah. So mm. I think that has influenced it a lot. Like mm-hmm. I remember um, Tanya Roxburgh, who'd done a review of Kurangai Tuku. I was talking about that somewhere else, and she's like, that's it. Mm. She's like, I was trying to put my finger on why, why it felt so Māori, but in English, and that's it. It was mm. the, that, yeah. The shifting of the verbs and the objects yes. around, yeah, yeah, had made it feel more like I was reading that. I'm saying this as Tanya now. I'm Tanya now. <laughs> <laughs> she said it, it made her feel like she was reading Te Reo Māori rather than English, but she didn't realise that, like, on a conscious level, it was subconscious. She's like, I don't understand why this feels right. Mm-hmm. So once I pointed it out, she was, ah, yeah. Yeah. that's it, oh. that's it. Yeah. yeah. So part of that was, yeah, that kind of offer yes. from whew, back, going back to theatre, theatre, theatre sports. <laughs> that offer from the from the editor to take out um, those positive pieces because it's you know tika to yep. to do it in that other way. Mm-hmm. But it actually supported what I was trying to say in the story as yes, well. Yes. Yes. So it was like a really important point and going yes that's what we need to do it was a lot of work I can only imagine <laughs> to go back and go oh look at all those lovely sentences that I have to rewrite and then read out again to make sure that the, the rhythm is, is good but once I had that rhythm 
yeah, it was easier to do it. So, yeah, you did ask me before. I will answer your questions eventually. I get there in the end. No, no, no. There's, <laughs> there's no rush. There's no beginning, middle, or end like the novel. <laughs> we're, we're all over the in place. the space. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was hard to get into a rhythm, but once I knew it, then I could do it. So there's an exercise that I do with, with students that I do myself, and I get... If you come to my classes, you you will experience this. Go to her classes, do it. <laughs> but it's, I guess it's a theatre a theatre sort of game where you create create your character and you know um, the biography of your character, so you know like how tall they are and how old they are, um, those kind of things, and who their people are and, and whatnot. And then I I take everyone for a walk. So we go for a walk to a place, usually to a, a landmark. So maybe a five minute walk. And you can do this by yourself, you don't need a a group, but sometimes it's fun to be with a group. And as we're walking, I get people to walk as themselves first, which sounds weird when I say it out loud, but to be aware of themselves as they're walking. So I'm asking them to think about their posture, like how would they normally walk? Do they walk upright or do they look down? Um, Where in the group that they gravitate towards? Like are you the front or the back? Would you rather have, like gone off somewhere else? Maybe I don't know. Mm. Where you walk from? So I walk primarily from my hips. Mm. So I kind of tip myself back a little bit, walk that way. Um, and then we get to the the meeting point, and I get them to sit down and think about their character, and get them to walk back as their character. So thinking about the same things. Yes. So for Kurungaitoku, I'm quite short. So I'm like 163 centimeters, I think, ish. Maybe That's excellent. I have no idea what that means in inches, but um, five foot four. <laughs> but every, everyone who listens <laughs> will. <laughs> five foot four. Got um, it. And Kurungaituku is at least seven foot. Amazing. If not taller. So, yeah, I was on my tippy toes quite a bit. But I like to do that because I see the world a little bit differently. So I see the world looking up. She sees the world looking down. So, yeah, there are things that I wouldn't catch that she would mm. perhaps mm. and things that I would notice that she wouldn't and things that she would notice that I wouldn't so I think it's a really useful kind of exercise to do and rhythm rhythmically like how do you walk I think how you walk can also influence how you talk mm. yes yes absolutely yeah I think because it, it's yeah. how you breathe right too yeah right. yeah because you have to yeah if you're a fast walker, you have to breathe a bit more. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the same with fast walking. So you have to breathe in the same way. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's feeling that rhythm, like physically for me, mm. is really helpful. So even doing that theater exercise when writing a novel, did you have to, like, walk around on your tiptoes after you got done eavesdropping on the bus? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do. I walk around. Yeah. And sometimes when I'm, like, describing faces and things, I'll do, like, the old cartoonist trick. So I've got the mirror, and I look at my face and see what it's doing. Yeah. So hopefully there's no furrowed brow- brows and all those kind of mm. cliches that you often have of people describing a face. Yeah. I'll go and make the face and, like, what's different and what, you know, what can I can focus on to get the idea of a frown yeah. across. Yeah. Mm. Beautiful. I like that. So it's fun. Actually, I didn't know that old comic trick. That's a useful one. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So you, I don't have a mirror by my desk. Apparently comics do. Huh. Like for yeah, cartoonists, I should say, probably. It's the more broad term. But yeah, you make the face, look in the mirror, and they would draw it. Yes. But yeah, I try words. and describe it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. I'm gonna see what other questions I have. You've, <laughs> you've taken me, taken me to places I didn't know we were gonna go. I have a habit of doing that. That's terrific. <laughs> uh, yeah. Ooh. Speaking of writing and speaking, mm. maybe and maybe this doubles up on things we've already talked about. But what 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 for you is the relationship? A bit abstract. What's the relationship? How do you see the relationship between the written word and the spoken word? Ooh. Oh, that's really interesting. Are they exactly the same until you no, speak it? Or are they know. different? I'm thinking of what you were telling me before about um, Laura Jean and making... So Laura Jean doing her voices for mm. her her novel and having different shaped 
mouth to get the different voices. So years ago I wrote a poem um, that's, that was similar about the shape people's mouths make. Oh, wow. When they when they speak. It was about O's. So, like, oh, your O's. I can't remember what it was. Love it. It's probably very bad poetry because I'm not a great poet. But anyway. I love the idea. I'm on board. Because <laughs> I think... I think our shape, the the physical shape of our of our face and our mouths does make a difference to the spoken word. Yes. Yeah. New Zealanders in particular. Before this, I was trying to loosen my jaw a bit because we we tend to have like quite a closed mouth mm. and mm. it's very tight in in the jaw and that makes our nice or well, not nice depending on our accent is per- apparently very sexy. <laughs> so we've heard. So we've heard. I don't know if that's true, but yeah, because it's the way that we've hold, held our mouth that makes mm. our, our sounds. So, yeah, I don't know. I like I like the idea that that letters were originally. I don't know if this is true, but this is what I think that letters are like a representation of what your mouth does mm. when when you speak. So, like. That's why the vowels are nice, round, mm. and open, because that's what your mouth is doing. Yeah. That's why I, O is shaped like an O. I've heard that about the Korean language, ah. that their characters, many of them often resemble the shape that your mouth makes. Yeah. Don't don't hold me to it, but so I've been told by a Korean friend. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good story, so I'm just going to yeah. believe it. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that the body is the instrument for speaking words. Yeah. And text is a representation of that. Yeah, because text came way later. Yes. We were telling stories yes. for millennia. Ages. Not even millennia, probably more than millennia, before any kind of writing came along. Certainly, yeah. So, I don't know. Did that answer your question? I can't even remember yeah. what the question was. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> uh, it was about the sort of what's different between the written and the spoken word, but... Yeah, and I think that definitely answers it. Um, it just made me think of the inverse question, which is like, where do they overlap? Um, but I don't know that that's so. In- I don't know if that's an interesting question. I don't know. Um, well, they have to, don't they? I yeah, guess. yeah. I just think that's the interesting thing. It's just so hard to write for speech. Um, when, yeah. Whether podcasters are doing it, or, or playwrights, or in this case, an epic poem of a novel that wants to be re- spoken and heard <laughs> aloud. Like it it's, does. It's so challenging to do. It really is because it's. I guess again, it's going thinking about not just what you're writing, but what your reader or your listener is receiving. Mm. So. Um, yeah, sometimes I talk about like having it, the idea of having like a big bag of like attention bucks, like money. <laughs> so whenever someone comes to the theatre or a novel, they've, they've come with this big bag of like expectations that they're going to love this. Mm. So they have all this, this money. The attention, the attention money. The attention money that they're willing to spend on things. So you as a writer, I guess, have to make the decision where you're going to spend those. Mm. Um, and so sometimes using that in a whole bunch of exposition that just makes your story go bleh, that spends a whole lot of attention bucks that you can't get back yeah. anywhere else. So, yeah, so sometimes that helps me when I'm thinking, that, am I doing this? Will this engage the reader and especially for rhetoric and I guess for, mm. for for speeches the aim of the speech is to get people on board yes. to change their lives to yeah. to move something mm. so if you're not holding their attention or if you are doing things to alienate them then that defeats your purpose right yeah yeah I mean I you can't pander to people either no but yeah that's why I think having that big bag of bucks idea works for me because sometimes, yes, you will need to spend some of this goodwill to get your point across, but you need to make sure that's balanced in a way. Yeah. You don't want to spend all that pandering. Yeah. No. You can tell I'm not an economist because I'm like, mm, this is <laughs> sort of how money works, I think. Fifty's making all these beautiful gestures <laughs> in here. The, 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 the theatrical personality that you are is coming through. Um, um, yeah, I talk with my hands a lot. 
Yeah. I do too. The only reason I'm like this is because I've hit the microphone way too many times I know, in, in I'm the studio. I know. I'm conscious of like <laughs> not punching the microphone. Done a good job of not doing it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so maybe the the last question um, I have is about vocal delivery because I do love the way that you read um, mm. written words, um, and you've worked in the theater before where you have to help actors yeah. say their lines. Um, what? Yeah. How? If you were giving tips to people trying to read some prose or poetry aloud or try to speak it, um, how? What would you tell them to think about to do to? Um, have in mind as they're trying to work on their vocal delivery yes give yourself lots of time is the first thing so make sure that you've got time to look at the thing you're reading and break it down so give yourself a lot of time so you can read it several times so you can feel where the the parts that you need to emphasize are and then write that down so my copy of kurangai toku that i read from has got all sorts of notes in it Uh, when i first started reading my work for people because it's like my work and I'd get all like ah I was fine on stage reading someone else's um, words but when it comes to my words I'd get freaked out I used to write breathe yes mark your breaths yep where I needed to on the page and also slow down (laughs) (laughs) so every at the top of every page it would pretty much be breathe or slow down (laughs) Um, I'm better at that now so I don't need to remind myself of that but I do I mark up my what I'm going to read so I'll put in where I'm going to pause I'll underline the words that I'm going to emphasize if there are words that I'm a little bit eh about the pronunciation I will spell them phonetically mm. in big words and put um, usually I put where the emphasis is in that what yeah what syllable I need to emphasize in mm. capitals so I know what to hit um, but yeah practicing a lot so I don't memorize it because I don't have to. Yes, yes. <laughs> so why use that brain capacity if I don't have to? But I've read it enough that I know what's happening next. So I, if I kind of look up, which I do, it's good to engage with the audience. I look up at, at the audience from time to time. I won't get totally lost. I also use post-it notes in my novel, novels so I can find where I am because I, I I recut my my work for reading yes to make it you've got a bit more patience I guess when you're reading a novel than you do on a stage so I, I recut my readings so they're nice and compact so I need those post-its so I can find where I am so yeah make it as easy as possible for yourself when you're reading beforehand Warming up is really important. Mm. So I was saying before that New Zealanders have got very tight jaws. We do. So sometimes, um, as well as doing the normal vocal warm-ups, I'll I either jam my the heel of my hand into that the part where your jaw mm. into that hinge, which hurts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're both doing it right now. Uh, it's not <laughs> It's not pleasant. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it does help loosen hmm. that so you can open your mouth a bit more. Um, and warming up your lips, and it all sounds very silly. Hopefully you've got somewhere like you can hide to do it, and you can do it and get warmed up. Um, also doing exercises to expand your chest. Mm, yes. Yeah, yeah, because we tend to kind of close in on ourselves particularly if we've been working on the computer so things like um I guess arm circles big arm circles um I saw one recent an exercise recently which I haven't tried which I'm going to try which is getting like a um uh, like two lacrosse balls yes and it's like a in a sock or something yeah like tying them together tying yeah. them together and then you put them in like between your shoulder blades Whoa. so you lie on it and then you bring your arms so you hold your arms out like at 90 degrees from your body, and then you bring your shoulder blades down on the lacrosse balls. Mm. Just to loosen all of that yes. so your chest is open, yeah. so you can take a breath yeah. and like push through that. So I haven't tried that yet. It sounds incredible. It sounds incredible and very sore. Uh, yes, painful a bit. Very painful. It's, I'm also really impressed that you know lacrosse balls. <laughs> <laughs> 
I use them a lot to as a physio <laughs> yeah, on my hard, muscles. But yeah. yeah, yeah. They're like for those of you who haven't heard of lacrosse, it's like a like a cricket ball maybe. Yeah. A little bit smaller than a cricket ball. Yeah. Kind of a tennis ball size, but like a cricket harder ball. Harder than a yeah, yeah, yeah. Hard harder than a tennis ball, certainly. So like cricket ball density. Yes. But tennis ball size. There you go. Yes, yeah. that's good. Yeah. I don't know enough about cricket to tell you about <laughs> the size of the cricket balls. <laughs> They're a little bit bigger then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, super. Well, how did we get to talking about I balls? don't know. <laughs> uh, slippery slope, that one. Um, but it was about about breathing. All the things yeah. you do to your body to shape it, to prepare to speak well. Yeah. If you're speaking in public too, I like to dress up. Mm, yes, yes, yes. I, I like a theme. Um, and part of that is... For the theatrical experience, but also it kind of puts a, a buffer between me and the world. Mm. Like I'm taking on this persona of a person who's reading this book, or the persona of of the character themselves. So sometimes I do that, um, and that helps me. I don't know if yeah. that's helpful for everyone. Yeah, it can change your posture, right? Yeah. The way when you play a character a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And just make sure you're comfortable. Mm. That's the main thing. Um, so I like to read standing up usually because I feel more powerful when I'm standing up, I guess. Yes. And so I can plant my feet and things. So, yeah, find a way that you're comfortable because the more you're comfortable, it'll come through in yeah. the reading. Yeah, well, that's good. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, maybe we can end by, at the beginning where we started, um, by going back to storytelling and sort of... Um, there's this one beautiful quote that I want, would love to hear you tell us more about. So you say the Tui and the Kaka sing different songs, but they both sing the truth. Yeah. And I love that. Tell us more. Ah, oh, thank you. Well, they do. Yeah, we've all got different songs to sing, um, but they're all our truths as well. So in that particular context, it was about how Hatupatu told his story that didn't include Kurangaituku. Um, and Kurangaituku's story, it's kind of hinting that Kurangaituku is not a reliable <laughs> narrator and that she's going to be telling an anti Hatupatu story almost. But both stories are true, and together they're kind of more true. The mm. true, true, -er, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Get the truest version of the story mm. by hearing lots of different things. But yeah, each person who tells a story, even if they're the opposite stories, they're still telling the truth. Hmm. Yeah. This kind of idea of, of objective truth is odd. Yes. Yeah. And I'm saying this as a person who studied law. It's very messy. And, um, yeah. Yeah. But the, the kind of concept that there can be a truth is nonsensical. Yeah. Of course there can't be. Can't everything. No way. Everything is subjective. Right. Yeah. Right. And... Um, it sounds like your novel is suggesting that it's a richer way of understanding the world to combine those, tr to thread and weave those truths together, those stories. Yeah. 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 So looking at things from other people's perspectives is always going to make your experience richer. Even if you hate that person and you think they're wrong, you'll, st you'll still get a, a different understanding about what had happened in, in that situation mm. if you take into account their story. Yeah. And then just bitch about it to your friends. Yes. Yeah. You <laughs> can still do that wrong. too. <laughs> wrong about that. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for spending time today. I appreciated it. It's okay. Thank you very much for having me here. It's been amazing. I learned heaps. <laughs>